Coming up on this week in Radio Tech, Chris Tobin takes us on a tour through how you get video onto your web stream. And yeah, I know you video guys know how to do this, but we're radio engineers. We may not know this. And so I'm learning so much on this episode. It takes us right through cameras, connections, boxes, and the software that it takes to then produce it and ship it out to Facebook and YouTube and wherever it needs to go. That's all coming up on This Week in Radio Tech. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcast Supply Worldwide, where it's Christmas for the caster. Save up to 61% whether you're a broadcaster, podcaster, voice caster, or everything caster at BSW. By the new Omnia Bolt audio processor. More processing power in one RU than others give you in three. And by the new Ruby console from Lavo. With auto-mix smart mixing and a context-sensitive user interface. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerked. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here on this chilly, wet, rainy, for many folks, uh, December day. It's it's the 21st. It's the shortest day of the year in the nor Northern Hemisphere, the longest night of the year. Of course, you folks in the Southern Hemisphere, hey, glad you're here, but you have it the other way around. It's the longest day of the year, maybe one of your warmest days, too, uh, although you probably still have some warmer days ahead and uh, shortest night of the year. So there you go. And since it's our longest night of the year, Chris Tobin is uh, is with us, and he's going to be uh, engineering and providing uh, lots of entertainment for folks uh, at night while they're shopping and listening and driving and stuck in traffic or maybe relaxing at home. Chris Tobin, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. How are you? I am doing well, Kirk. I'm uh, on location. We're doing a broadcast this evening. It's going to involve uh, audio for the radio program and then video for the uh, web audience. So I'm just here at a venue getting things in together so uh, the lights are coming out as you can see i've somewhat shadowed a little bit and uh yeah. we'll talk we can talk about it but yeah it's gonna be fun actually the, the the light looks striking and artistic it looks good actually uh, it was just the last minute i threw it up real quick apparently the overhead lights turned off because of lack of motion but then they won't come back on oh okay it's amazing <laughs> things that some of these facilities do that just i don't know <laughs> well Chris Tobin, today you are our guest, and today Chris is going to uh, walk us through some of the nuts and bolts of putting uh, an event uh, on a video stream, uh, how they do that at WBGO, and and make that happen. And so, uh, and then I'll I'll in, I'll be asking the dumb questions. <laughs> how do you do this? How do you do that? Uh, and well, today we'll we'll jump into it. So hang on. Uh, our show is what did I what did I call our show today? Visual. Video for radio, something or other. Um, good gal, hang on. I'll, 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 I, I, I thought about this for a minute. Live video production for radio. There you go. Live video production for radio. We'll try to call it that or something like it. Maybe a better uh, name will pop up. Our show, This Week in Radio Tech, episode 376, and the show's coming up, is brought to you by our friends at Lavo, L A W O, German company. So you say it Lavo with a Kind of a just a touch of a V, Lavo, and uh, it's lavo.com slash twerked. So when you go there, add the slash twerked to the URL, lavo.com slash twerked, and uh, it'll take you right to the radio page where they have all their radio products. Now, you may have known Lavo for years and years for making these huge audio consoles, the kind that go into big remote trucks and at uh, concert venues and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, the big sound thing or, or at the Olympics um at opera houses things like that well they take they've taken uh their expertise in these big mission critical uh, consoles and mix sound mixing systems also uh sound distribution and routing and they've put that into small consoles for the radio business uh anywhere from just a few faders up to, you can still you know pile a few of these together and get you a bunch of faders but they've also taken their automation and uh, what they understand about um how to make consoles do things automatically and beautifully visually and automate processes that you may need to be uh, that you may need to have automated and put that all together in packages for folks in the radio business. And that's why companies like the BBC and Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and NPR uh, have, among many others, have chosen Lavo to be their consoles because they can do so much. Lavo consoles also are able to do a lot of stuff uh, with a simple interface on top and a lot going on under the hood. And right now on the screen, you're looking, if you're watching our video playback, you are looking at the new Ruby console from Lavo. And this is the console that really brings to bear this notion of a simple interface for the on-air staff to use. 
that does so much under the hood, including auto mix. Now that's a feature that, I mean, if you're in the sports radio business, if you are in the, if you're doing a, uh, any kind of thing where you've got a bunch of different people talking, um, and they, maybe they want to step on each other. Maybe you got a, uh, a, a host that needs to be able to step on any of them. Well, this is worth checking out the auto mix feature from Lavo and it's in several of their consoles, but it's also in this Ruby console. Uh, you can see on the Ruby console, the, uh, the faders come in blocks of four. So you can have a small console or a really large console, anything in, in between. Um, you can get all kinds of visual information on screen. And of course, as an engineer, uh, you can set this up. Now it comes out of the box just about ready to go. Doesn't need a whole lot of configuration, but you can also get under the hood, as I like to say, and configure a whole bunch of stuff under the hood. By the way, um, you know, if you've got a busy talk show going, you've got guests coming in and out. One of the other cool features is this feature where you can uh, automatically set the level. And this is the input level to the mic preamp. So if you've got uh, somebody come in, comes in, sits down, and, and they're super loud and boisterous, and you know the kind of person I mean. Hey, and the sports world is full of them. Well, you have them uh, while they're talking. Just push push a button on the console, and that will set the optimum level for the mic preamp. So they're not going to blow the preamp out, and they are going to be at the right level. Then you've got somebody comes in who's off mic. They're way back. They whisper, they don't talk very loud. They're maybe they're a little intimidated. That's okay. You can push that uh, auto level set again, and it will, it will set them up for the right level, the very best that it can and uh, get you a good level from any, any player, <laughs> any talent, any person on microphone. Um, this really works so well. You can have clocks on screen, timers on screen, uh, access to social media feeds. You can have, have access to almost anything that's HTML. You can have it right there on the screen. Uh, traffic reports, traffic cameras, a hey, ski slope condition cameras, things like that. A lot of fun, a lot of utility though, too, in the Lavo Ruby console. Check it out. Go to Lavo, L-A-W-O.com slash twerked. Click on the Ruby console and you will see how, how radio never looked so good. Thanks a lot, Lavo, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, Chris Tobin, speaking of looks. So uh, Chris Tobin and I were at a conference in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago. Uh, Chris, you want to kind of recap what that conference was about, about visual radio? Well, I guess the best way to put it is, um, as the broadcast industry has changed, as we know, radio is not just about the audio of the theater of the mind. It's now uh, being augmented by something we call video. And as a result, the, vis the visual symposium, visual radio symposium, I think New Bay Media is the first time they've done this. So this is not something you've missed years past. They thought time now is to uh, let's look at the other options for bringing in I'll call non-traditional revenue and radio stations. As we all know, you're, you're doing it probably currently with Facebook and uh, YouTube and Vimeo and everything else. Uh, the video augments. That's what I call it. It augments what you're doing or extends your brand. So do not think of it in terms of the radio portion is you're no longer doing radio you still are but now you're adding you're taking the pictures that people can't see and oh, could not see in the past and now you're bringing them to the foreground and i think uh, that's the best way to put it that's the takeaway i have and i and i know there were several folks on the panel that sort of said well no longer radio we're, we're multimedia or with this with that the reality is you're still radio you're just augmenting what you do at what you do best okay and we heard from a number of panelists, and I know there were there were two that I thought were particularly good. I mean, they all had good contribution to add. But uh, who was the fellow that I think you had worked with before in, in New York City? Oh, Mike Fox. Mike. Yes. M-I-C yeah. Mike. M yeah, M-I-C Mike, Mike Fox. Fox. Yeah. yeah. So, yes. and, and, and he had he what, what enthusiasm that Mike has and some very definite ideas. And then the other guy was Dan McQuillan, uh, who we've had as a guest on our show here before. Uh, we might want to get Mike Fox on a, a, as a guest if we can. Uh, and Dan McQuillan, uh, we've had on before talking about visual radio and what he thinks is important, what he thinks, you know, uh, as they say, moves the needle for listeners and viewers uh, of visual radio. But both of them had this enthusiasm about uh, doing it right. And I noticed that Mike Fox's ideas, Chris, were very much in line with your ideas uh, about what works and what's probably not worth doing. Am I right about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, his his goal was, you know, it's content as the phrase goes, content is king. But you have to be providing content or creating 
uh, program that the audience is going to consume because that's what you do. So if your radio station is a urban format, right, Ur urban dance, then whatever video you're doing on video vignettes should be based around that genre. You know, that's what you're doing. Don't don't find something else to do. Don't go to a local retailer and, and do something different. Just stick to that, but enhance what you have. And that's what he was talking about, though. They have several folks on staff, videographers, where they'll take snippets of the day. Say the morning show has an artist comes in, and they're talking, they do stuff, they create snippets. Maybe a two-minute piece, three-minute piece, or, or longer or shorter, and just highlight that throughout the day. So I usually call it peppering it throughout the day. And that mm -hmm. way you create uh, a, an experience and, and feeling that, hey, I missed out on something. I can catch it tomorrow because that is the show I listen to. Now I can see what they're talking about. So that it creates more. That doesn't cannibalize your product. I know there's a lot of folks in the past when I've worked at a few stations where they would say, well, if we do video, that's going to cannibalize the morning show or the afternoon show, or the middays, and people aren't going to tune into the radio. The reality is they're going to still tune in. But now you're giving them something even more to do with it. You know, if you're in the office, you're not tuning into the radio. You're streaming it on the computer in the office. So it's mm -hmm. still to them a radio consumption. It may not be a physical radio as we call it. But again, I always tell people when I talk to folks at a couple of seminars I've been at, think of yourself in terms of the listener. What did they perceive? And I can mm -hmm. tell you that they don't think of radio as the box we think of it as. They don't think of it as a CHR format if you're talking one station or urban or spoken word. All they know is it's their favorite person, favorite songs, and it happens to be on a radio station they know as X. That's it. We go too far in the industry, you know, the inside baseball stuff. And that's what <laughs> the symposium panel was talking about. Michael and the others were saying, hey, you know, it, 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 think of it in terms of the end user, the consume, you know, the person consuming it. What do they, what do they perceive it as? That's why a lot of times, I think people in the industry get uh, too caught up and say, oh, you know, you, you got to have twelve radio stations in the market in order to have saturation to make it work. It's like, no, the reality is, you could probably make a, you know, a million dollars easily a day if with one radio station that touched the audience the way they should. They created something that you can't get anywhere else. I know so tell you what, we'll think, think that's true. One thing we've, we've promised about this episode is we would, uh, since you're there on site, getting ready to do a broadcast tonight. You, now, this is going to be a, a, a long form broadcast, right? This isn't a little snippets best of. You're doing a whole long form thing online? Yes, this is a long form. It's a public affairs show that we do every month. It's uh, mm. hosted by uh, one of the local television news anchors here in, in New Jersey. And uh, the guest, well, it's the, the, the show is called Newark Today. And it's basically mm -hmm. the mayor's the mayor of Newark is is one of the guests, and then we have several other guests that come on, and it's Q and A. And then uh, we've been doing this in the studio for years, never in a mm -hmm. live audience situation. So for the last uh, four months, we've been on the road, uh, and we've been doing these uh, live, if you will, town hall type broadcasts, and it's been very successful. So we thought we'd continue it through the end of the year, which is now December, and that's what this is. It's going to be a live broadcast, 8 p.m. this evening. You can watch on Facebook on the webpage, or you can listen to it on the radio. We have two different paths leaving the facility, and uh, that's what it's going to be. Yeah, it's a it's a stage. I'll turn the camera around. You'll see it. So you'll have this on Facebook Live uh, with video. First, let's cover uh, just briefly what our radio engineer audience would be most familiar with and that's the audio only feed because that's what we've always dealt with in radio so you're doing a, a, a mic you got you got mics you got a mixer and you probably got some kind of codec to get the audio back to the station right yes yes well we have four microphones for the guests and then the fifth microphone is for the host and then that's mixed into a, a mixer and that program mix has also we also have a laptop running a play it application that's the name of the, the application play it so think of it as a cart machine, software cart machine. Mm. And there's where the sounders, bumpers, uh, promos, and, and all the different elements of the show are. And then that's fed into the mixer, and the program out goes into an audio codec and over IP back to the studio for broadcast. That's the, that's the one path. That's the primary path. That's our main piece. And that gets streamed out as well on the website and on the radio. Well, I'm just just curious, uh, what, what brand of mics are you liking for this application? What mixer is it, and what codec is it? Well, the uh, the microphones are SM58 Shures. We, uh, oh, good. We Standard, we real. Yeah. Well, we yeah. went with the dynamic mic simple because we're in a very loud room. I don't, I'm sure if you can hear mm -hmm. it. But let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, condenser mics, which some people prefer to do, would probably be the wrong choice. We did try that the first time four mo five months ago, and uh, the pre preliminary sound check failed. So we chose to go mm -hmm. with dynamics. The SM58s okay. are fine. And then the mixer is a Mackie uh, 16 channel mixer, standard Mackie mixer, oh, yeah. nothing fancy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then the audio codec is a, a Musicam Suprema 
So that's uh, connecting back to the studio. And we're running it at, uh, I think I, I got it running at 320 kilobits. Yeah, 320 and MPEG-2 just for fun. And it works fine. The bandwidth is leaving the facility here. Yeah. What's that? Is this over public internet or a private line? Well, it's it, the uh, Rutgers University is hosting mm -hmm. the internet service. Then it gets over mm -hmm. the public and back to our side of things. So yeah, it's public. Okay. It's totally public. Okay. Um, but with the nice thing is we arranged with them a dedicated IP address, dedicated service connection. I'll call it that. I mean, quality of service, whatever you want to call it. And <clears throat> and that's helped us a lot. So we're not just on the network with everything else. They sort of said, okay, we'll carve out a path for you. Think of it as like ISDN, a dedicated path out to the, to the internet. After that, you're on your own. That's fine. At least, you know, the last, the first mile we control. The middle we can't control. The last mile we have the studio. So that's how we got it working. And so far for the last five broadcasts, we've been uh, very fortunate. It's worked out very nicely. Okay. So that takes care of the audio portion. Oh, I guess there's uh, another uh, uh, Music Ham Suprema at the other end uh, decoding yes. it back to audio. Okay, cool. Yes, exactly. All right, good standard setup there. I'm it's amazing you're doing. And if you know, if you got the bandwidth to do MPEG layer two at a high bit rate, it's great. It, what you don't want to do is do MPEG two at too low of a bit rate. It gets dirty. Well, yeah. We, I mean, if you do AAC HE, that's optimized for 56 kilobits, mm -hmm. right? So why bother? I'll just go with MPEG two, crank it up. 320 is fine. I mean, we all know that many, many years ago, if you had an auto automation system and you did music storage on it, you were doing MPEG-2 at 320. That was the standard. Yeah. And very few yeah. people had a problem with that. So I figured, why not do this? It's spoken word. It's mono. So I'm actually getting more out of it <laughs> yeah. because I'm not yeah. really trying to do any sum indifference. It's, so it's, it's actually more fun. And it sounds fine. I mean, it, you'd be hard pressed to know the difference. And, I, and I, that's what we're doing. And it's nice. Okay, so for video, would you have an opportunity to turn your camera around and kind of give us a little view of what you're doing? Is that is that possible yes. or not? Yes. yes okay. Yes, hang on. Well, well, well now me. now's the time to do. It. Okay, Chris is turning his camera around. Yeah. We're going to learn about how Chris does this this you know talk show this Q and A, and uh, oh, he's got some there, actual cameras there. there. There's yeah. an actual camera. There we have two of them. These are Sony PXV seventies, I believe it's the proper term. They're very very popular for uh, documentary work and stuff, and for what we're doing. And there's a second one over here. There okay, and you, so you you'll have us uh, uh, live camera operators to point at you know what looks good. Right? Yes, that that'll be me. I'm the one doing both cameras oh, and switching. Oh, and the lower third. okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is. Oh, I should have mentioned the whole concept. This was a proof of concept the first time we did it. We didn't mm -hmm. expect it to continue past the first broadcast because we thought it'd be just chaos. And it turned out to be very successful, so we're going through with it, and we're enjoying it. So 2018, there'll be a whole new approach that makes sense now that we've got our several broadcasts and uh, workflows under our belts. Now we know what to do. So if you look into the back the distance, that's the stage. There are yeah. four chairs for the guests. To the right-hand side is the podium for the host. And as mm -hmm. you can see, our logo for the projector. And I don't know if I can f do it. Well, behind that column is where the Mackie mixer and the audio engineer will be for the, the ah, okay. Okay. Now, what's it looks like there's uh, HDMI connections from the camera back to wherever they go. Is that yes. what that connection is? Yes. So when we did the proof okay. of concept, we didn't have all the hardware in place yet because of the cost, and we were just weren't certain what to expect. So these cameras produce both SDI out and HDMI. So we're mm. going to use the HDMI output, and then we go into an Asia card, or two of them, two Asia cards for SDI, I'm sorry, HDMI to uh, USB 3 and into an i5 a Dell computer. And uh, it's where we're... we're we're stressing it. I mean, you definitely need to have a hefty <laughs> machine when you're doing this stuff. So, hey, hey Chris, okay. I'm, I'm I'm sorry. I was uh, I was actually yapping and, and not keeping keeping up. Uh, what model are the cameras? I'm gonna put uh, link, links in the show notes to these. So these I are the believe, Sony. The Sony PXV 70s, I believe, or PXW-70. Okay. I believe, All right. Yeah. When people see them, they know what they are. They're very popular, well known. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. They're very good. And, By the um, way, so, uh, yes. if you if you record on the camera itself, is that is it a tape or a SSD type of camera? That will be a, an SD card. SD class card, 10 okay. Or, higher, or class okay. six. Or yeah. So the two camera shots. So one camera is head on for the guests and, and so, ISO shots of guests, and this camera yeah. to the left in the screen is actually I keep on the host. So basically, I have the ability to switch between two camera positions so I can set up the second camera. So when yeah. the host is talking, I can now move to the camera two, get that position on a guest who may be about to answer a question, and then I can fade back. So that's that's the reasoning and the idea behind that. All right, so you, you mentioned now from the cameras, HDMI cables to an Asia box, and that's AJA, is that correct? 
That is correct. Hang on. Let's see mm -hmm. if I can do this without blowing everything up. Hopefully I can make this right. So no, our, our friends, I, I, I'm just starting to become familiar with some of the stuff myself and our friends at Broadcast Bionics. Uh, when they do a multi-camera setup, they're doing uh, uh, it into a Blackmagic uh, rack mount box. So this is an Asia UTAP. Yes, I have a Blackmagic as well here. Um, so I'm using both. I have, I have a couple. I've been using the Asia because it just uh, a friend of mine gave it to me a while back. I tried it. It worked. It's been working very well. The form factor is ideal, as you can see. It fits in the palm of your hand. There's, there's my hand. So there's the USB 3 on the one side. Yeah. USB 3. Okay. That's it. How's it powered by the nice. USB? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. So that gives you video in a format that's on USB. And so that way, if you plug when whatever uh, laptop you plug it into uh, or computer you, you plug it into, a lot of programs recognize USB video sources. Like even Skype does, right? Yes. Yes. It's, okay. it's exactly, it's, okay. it's just same protocols USB cameras do. Uh, you know, it's, mm -hmm. that's basically it. But it gives you the ability, and they also have a UTAP for SDI. So SDI is a higher okay. bandwidth speed rate. So I didn't do that because the, the computer I'm running into, I'm using the onboard USB 3 card uh, ports. I don't recommend that. I have a computer at home where I have a separate card which has individual controllers for each USB port. Very important oh. to realize. Most computers, like this desktop, are sharing the bus. So the controller is maybe one controller doing two ports or maybe three. So it, mm -hmm. it gets a little, a little dicey. So I have at home uh, an actual dedicated PCI uh, e-card that has uh, four ports, and each one has its own controller. And I can tell you, huge difference in performance. And even that machine. You know, we, we learned that a long time ago. Um, well, I don't think we talked about it, but even me doing this show with the uh, MacBook Pro laptop that I use, I yes. used to try to combine my sound, my external sound box, uh, which came out USB, and my camera, which was USB combine them into one box and then send that to a USB port on the, on the laptop. And that wasn't so good. We'd get all kinds of, you know, weird things going on. And so I ended up separating. So my, my camera goes into one USB port on one side of the laptop and the audio goes in the one on the other side. I, I assume they're on different controllers because they're on, you know, they're 13 inches apart on the laptop, right? So they're probably different controllers. And that seems to work. And as you can see right here, you get pretty good video and audio from me with, you know, no USB related problems anyway. Yes. I mean, there, there have been a lot of machines that still have USB ports, say, on the front of the machine, that sort of a shared port. The rear connectors on the mm -hmm. chassis may be part of an actual controller. There's a few things you have to look at the specs. You'll see early days, they were all shared for the longest time. But yeah. Nowadays, I think, yeah. I think the manufacturers have realized they need to sort of break out the resources. So it makes sense. Okay, so from the Asus uh, USB, you said USB 3? Uh, yes, okay. USB 3. And your computer, um, uh, I'm sorry, this one may be shared, you may or may not, but they're, on, they're all on board on, on the motherboard, right? At the moment, they are. Because it's a small form factor PC, the PCI mm. card that I have will not fit in the slot. So yeah. that was the last yeah. one. Oh, oops. But again, this was a proof of concept. It's actually working. So 2018 will move toward more beefed up and you know more dedicated setup. So is there any, now you're about to get to telling me about the software that you use and we'll do a commercial break here shortly before we really get into that. Is there any intervening software between the USB ports where the, the cameras come in and, uh, and, and your, and your, your mixer, how about your audio mixer? How does that get into this computer? Well, the audio mixer program out is fed to the uh, mic inputs on the camera, which then gets embedded into the HDMI. So oh, so you feed it back out to the camera? Yes, out to the camera. Okay. okay. So this way could, I keep everything could, in sync and just pair it, bring it through. What if you what if what if your Mackie board was one of those and uh I've got a Behringer that's got a USB port on it, so it, it can act like a sound an outboard sound card from a, a, a PC. Could you run the audio in that way? And if so, would it be in sync? You can do that. It should be in sync. But remember, when you're doing video, it is a mm -hmm. resource intensive uh data. So mm -hmm. every time you plug something into your computer, it's going to take resources and clock cycles. I personally would prefer probably keeping the audio into the HDMI path, bring it in, strip it out in the software and do it that way. Because when you mm -hmm. start loading up the machine, unless you're running a real powerhouse and you're talking, you know, if you do it right, a, a good machine would probably be starting at around $3,500 to, to, to do it. Wow. Wow. Because you remember okay. video, anybody who does video knows that, you know, well, if you're an editor, you know, 
trying to edit you know 1080p it, it it takes a lot of resources now move to 4k and mm -hmm. forget it you, cool. you're, you're redoing everything speaking of are your cameras 4k or 1080 uh they're doing 1080 but they are 4k okay. capable we do have the oh, okay. uh, software in for it. the firmware is in there but you're spitting out at, at 1080 that that's fine for your streaming purposes oh yeah and, yeah uh, trust me you know. there's no way anybody would know the difference between 1080 1080p and 4k and i doubt this machine would even it would croak it would just come to a yeah. halt okay just, yeah. So uh, uh, before we go to break, just to make sure I understand, there's no other intervening software except dr uh, drivers, I suppose, between your USB ports and the software that you, the application you use to switch cameras and do all the fancy schmancy stuff that we're about to get to in a minute. That's correct. Well, the Blackmagic box has a driver set. The Asia did not. I think it just used a default, whatever they, is the name for that um, default mm -hmm. USB protocol. But yeah, it's very straightforward. Okay. All right. Cool. All right, Chris is next going to carry us through the the application that does the camera previewing and lets you do switching, lets you do some graphics, some lower thirds. I guess it has a little bit of a DVE, that's digital video effects. And then uh, we'll talk about you know what the output is, uh, what you can, how you can record you know the straight video, the the high quality feed, and then uh, what it has available, what what software nowadays lets you do to put a program uh, into Facebook Live or perhaps upload it to YouTube Live uh, or in, in these uh, any of the other kind of formats. I, that's just fascinating that you can do several at once. Uh, you you want to do the one that's going to be best for your, your audience. So we'll get to that in a minute. And then Chris and I are also going to talk about, he doesn't know it yet, we're going to talk about a, a few other uh, little hardware goodies. I've got a few things laying around here I just want to talk about with Chris and get his thoughts on them because I know he uses them. <laughs> so I want to, and I haven't yet. So I thought, I know he's going to tell us all about it. Hey, our show this week in radio tech is uh, this week in television tech, just about TV tech for radio broadcasters is brought to you in part by our friends at Broadcast Supply Worldwide. And I really appreciate them sponsoring the show at Broadcast Supply Worldwide, bswusa.com. Got two things to talk about. First of all, the Christmas for the caster sale, where you can save up to 51%, whether you're a broadcaster, podcaster, voice caster, or everything caster, you can take advantage of the lowest prices of the year on a wide range of gear. They got microphones, Henry Super Relays. They have these fantastic Audio Technica uh, headsets. Uh, they have reporters' mics that are on sale. Uh, that uh, incredible uh, um, Yellow Tech uh, microphone. Podcast package deals with uh, systems from Tascam, their US 42 Mini Studio, for example, or the US 32 Mini Studio. My favorite standalone mic processor because it's so simple and so it works so well uh, it's the one i'm using right now it's the um uh the dbx 286s s stands for silver face so i can i can see it in the dark <laughs> under my <laughs> under my desk and uh and and more microphones for sale uh, on sale the electro voice re320 for example is on sale um and uh also the uh, air tools voice processor that is uh, on sale too so lots of good sales going on Right before Christmas, it's not too late to order. In fact, you could uh, you could even order today. If you're listening or watching This Week in Radio Tech live, it isn't too late. They can get it on a plane uh, tomorrow. Uh, no, tonight. Get on a plane tonight. You can have it tomorrow. Now, the other thing I want to mention about BSW is that BSW USA is the distributor for the HDV Mixer. And uh, the HDV Mixer does a lot of the same things uh, that Chris is going to be telling us about with uh, the vMix uh, product. So um, the, I was talking to um, John Lynch at BSW just about an hour ago, talking about, well, what, for a broadcaster, what's the real advantage of the HDV mixer? Now, we've we've done a spot or two on this show about the HDV mixer. I think the benefit for broadcasters is that they have so many different packages available. You just buy a package. It comes with the cameras, it comes with uh, the either the, the the computer, either the laptop or the tower computer. It comes with you know the 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 cards that you need. In other words, it's it's ready to work out of the box. You don't have to try to mix and match things and make a mistake buying a computer that's not powerful enough. Uh, and they have all these different sizes of packages, anywhere from about a thousand dollars up to seventeen thousand dollars. They have packages all in between with different numbers of cameras, different ways to control the mix. The, the video switching, the audio mix, uh, you can you just bring all this stuff into uh, the, either the, the laptop or the the uh, the tower computer, and it's ready to roll as far as putting out to any of the social media platforms. Uh, 
By the way, maybe you have an external video switcher already. Maybe you've been delving into this world of video for radio. Uh, no problem. The output of that video switcher should just plug right into uh, the HDV mixer. At the very most, you would just use a, a converter from uh, Asia, like uh, Chris was showing, or Blackmagic, and, and convert that into USB uh, to work with the HDV mixer. Uh, there are so many packages available. You really want to get a quote. You want to find out what's, what you need for your station, for what you want to do. Do you want to broadcast um, shows like what Chris is doing tonight with uh, city council members and guests and guest speakers? Uh, or do you want to do uh, a sports broadcast? Do you want a football game, a basketball game? Or like John Lynch does, this high-speed boat racing uh, on rivers and lakes. Just amazing stuff. Um, well, your HDV mixer can do any of that, but be sure you get the right package. So what you want to do is call BSW USA and their phone number is 800-426-8434. Now you can write that down or memorize it, uh, put it in your little black book or your electronic Rolodex, um, or you can just go to bswusa.com and the toll-free number is right there, 800-426-8434. Uh, John Lynch is great to talk to about these things. The guy is just amazing, and he uses it. He's a sports broadcaster himself, so he can help you decide what exactly to get, and um, you're going to be happy with it. it. It's got graphics built in. You can do picture-in-picture, side-by-side, you know, uh, uh, double boxes, all this kind of stuff. You can even bring in guests on Skype. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, you can also have pre-recorded video uh, in the computer and play that back uh, in a box or full screen, put graphics over that. So it's really a, a, a full production package that's just right for radio stations to use to to get going in the world of uh, online video to en enhance enhance the, the uh, listeners and viewers' experience. Thanks a lot to BSW USA for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech and their website, bswusa.com. All righty, Chris, let's get, jump back on it here with... Uh, the software that you're using, I think you said it was called vMix, yeah? Yes, yes, vMix. Tell me about what vMix is. Well, vMix is uh, basically a video switcher, digital effects, uh, streaming. If you choose to stream from it, you can stream, I think, two streams at once, maybe more. They now are NDI compatible, so you can do that new tech digital interface. I think it's called new tech. Oh, that's right. Uh, so, in, in NDI, yeah, I heard, I, I saw a new tech at um, the NAB show a couple of years ago when they were introducing, uh, really starting to push NDI. And, you know, our favorite redhead who, put, who explains this, Kiki Stockhammer, was there. Everybody should know Kiki from the video toaster days because she was, I mean, she was the pitch girl for, for the video toaster. Uh, so right. tell me, tell me what, what, what is NDI? Do I have to know what that, what that is? Well, NDI is an option for you to bring your video and audio across an IP network. IP packets. So the two cameras I have here could easily be doing, if they had the interface, a LAN interface, IP NDI protocol, just like you'd say Livewire, uh, across the network back to my computer, and then I okay. can call it up as a source. It's the same principle. So when you think of that, and think of what you could do with that, there's a lot of opportunity. So, uh, you know, SDI has a distance limitation, HDMI does. But mm -hmm. if it's an IP domain, maybe yeah. you don't have a dist you don't have a distance limitation anymore. Now you just have a network capacity and handoff as to where you put it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, and I remember NDI is is designed to be a low latency video over IP standard. Right? Yes, it is designed. The protocol itself is designed for low latency. So if your network is mm -hmm. properly configured and you have the switches where they should be, uh, yes, it'll be low latency. Now, if you decide to take it outside the premises or off the WAN, you know, outside the mm -hmm. enterprise beyond your boundaries, then there'll be latency. But you should know that anyway, going into that. But right. as a, as far as in the studio, physically in the plant, like I am right here, it's fine. It would work just fine. So in in vMix, what what's your interface? What is the person using vMix? What are you seeing on, on the screen all at once? Well, let me show you that. I guess this is the best way to bring this around. Let's see if okay. I can do this. I didn't know if, you, if, you, if your cable was long enough to get that done. Well, if, it's, if, I'm actually at the computer itself. Let's see. So I'm, I'm hoping you see, a, uh, you, you see a couple of preview screens. So, you know, so you can preview the cameras, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Can you see it? Is it, is it coming out yeah. okay? Am I shaking yeah. the camera too much? Well, I'll shake you there. Tell us what's on the screen. Okay, what's on the screen on the left-hand side is a traditional preview screen. So if you're familiar with uh, video switches, Grass Valley, Chiron, the whole bit, you know, uh, the previews on the left, program out is on the right. So on the right now is a camera, live camera shot of the studio stage, uh, the, the, the venue stage. 
and then yeah. below is lower third that I've created. Now that lower third, if you look at it, watch it carefully, and if I do this, you notice the image a graphic goes away. Oh yeah, back. okay. So oh. And then, oh yeah, and then I can take away the graphic. Whoop, there we go. And we could put somebody else in there if we choose. Oh look, the mayor. The mayor's name. Ah, okay. okay. But notice the logo so, or notice the bug mm -hmm. stays there as I choose. So in your lower left, you've got a number of little preview screens. Some of them are previewing lower third graphics. That's correct. So the lower, okay. the lower half of the screen, the below the fold, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. on the far left is the actual camera input using the UTAP. The, mm -hmm. other, the other black screens that you see are the actual effects or the overlays. And each of them can be labeled. So I have one that's called the run of show bug. The bug is, as we know in the business, is the little logo that goes in the lower corner of the screen, left or right. Mm -hmm. That's what is traditionally known as the bug. So this particular screen, this one here on number two that I'm, I'm moving the mouse over, is my run of show. That's the one that's always up. The bug is always up. Then I have another one called the host bug overlay, which is what you're looking at right now mm -hmm. because I have an overlay. So if I have no overlays, just a screen, then we do the bug. Okay. And there we go. Okay. See, the bug has just appeared. But now if I do an overlay with a graphics name with a name in it, the bug is in the right place because I position it that way. So now you see the show name, location, it's live, and then the radio station bug. And these yeah. are all graphics yeah. you, you you built in advance. And I can take it away, take it away, and I could go this, whoops, and go like that. And then we can go like this, boop, and then I could bring back my show bug like so. Now I'm, now I'm confused I'm, by one thing, Chris. Uh, you're in you're in Newark there, and I, I don't think there's a beach with horses running. What, what am I looking at? Well, no, that's correct. So on the left side is the pro preview. The other camera, I didn't have a chance to finish running the cable, so I couldn't show oh. you the two cameras. Show. So what I'm showing okay. you is when you transition between. There we go. Ah, uh, video. Ah, right, okay. so I can, and now I can go back to my run of show bug. So this way I can keep the logo up. And I'm running a video. This video could be something that should be produced early on before the show or during, before, during the show. And then when I come back, I want to come back. I can just do a fancy graphic if I choose. Wee, like so. Gotcha. So that, that's part of the, the DVE if you want to do digital. That would be the digital effects. You, right. You've got things right, like that. Right, right. So you have all okay. the different choices. You have koala bears yeah. you can see or you can fade back. <laughs> and it looks like you've got an audio mixer in the lower right. Is that it? Now, the lower right-hand side is the audio section, and it is an audio mixer. So you have the, the output of the software, the output controls, the actual inputs to the software, and then mm -hmm. the devices or the mechanisms that the audio could be coming in on. So as you can see, I have two sources of audio. One is the video camera itself, the HDMI video, and the second source is the actual wave, uh, I'm sorry, the Windows media file, the video. Mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. now say I just want the video only, no audio, I turn off the speaker, you toggle it on and off. But the speaker here, is turned on always because the M is means the input audio goes to the master. This is my camera audio, or in this case, the program show audio. So no matter what you see on the top, so if I change, I still will have audio coming from the camera. So somebody mm. could be narrating this video as they're watching it. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to do anything more than just simply change the video source because the audio is already being routed to the master bus, program bus, whatever you want to call it. And you're already mixing the video on a, I'm sorry, the audio on a separate mixer, the different mics. Yes, that's so exactly, yeah. exactly. If I if that wasn't the case, then we would have another mixer in here. Each microphone would come up in the screen in this lower section that uh, below the fold, the little black boxes would be audio sources. So if I want to add an input, I'd select mm -hmm. add input, go to the screen that says audio in, select the device. Uh, I'll just pick something out of goofiness. I'll hopefully it won't crash anything on us. And try that. And because it's not there, won't do it. But basically, you'd call up the, the device, and then you'd select it, and it would appear in the boxes below, and that would be your mixing, and you can set your levels accordingly. How, do you know how many audio sources you could bring in at the same time in, in vMix? Um, you're limited by, I think, the horsepower of the machine, and I think you could do, I think, up to 10 or more. I haven't tried it. I haven't looked at it, because oh. most of the stuff I do is typically six or seven at max. So they have, and the vMix yeah. has several levels of software choices. So you have to sort of look at which package you want to go with. Mm, uh, okay. Okay. And, you know, and if you want to do like we're doing with the vMix call, which is a WebRTC selection, you can actually add that input by doing a video call and you can set up the vMix call. I think I got that. Whoa. Yeah. So, okay. So, you, uh, all right. So you can bring in a video or, or audio and video. You, you could bring in of a, 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 what we're doing right now because 
you and yes. I are both connected to the GFQ network, not over Skype. We used to use Skype exclusively. Now there are other options. We typically use something called vMix Call, which uses the WebRTC protocol in a browser to That's make correct. this work. And, yeah. and this is a built in to, of course it is, the same name, same company, into the vMix uh, video editing software or video switching software. Okay. Yes. So essentially, you can do everything in this one setup. Okay. So you could yeah. bring me in during the middle of their show to ask some nutty questions. That's correct. No, you could. Now, it ain't going to happen, but you could. I could, yes. <laughs> What's nice about right. this whole package, this whole approach, is it's it's mm -hmm. integrated into one platform. Whereas mm -hmm. years past, if you wanted to bring all these different sources in, and those of us who have done video work, and I know the TV uh, engineering audience knows this all too well, you had separate packages devices mechanisms you know yeah, cables everywhere yeah. boxes on a shelf you know the whole bit now with the right software with the right hardware it can be done in one fell swoop and it's a good thing or it could be a bad thing if you don't pay attention and do it right like this setup i have here trust me if i go beyond what we're doing right now the machine would just croak it would die yeah so yeah best in the hardware <laughs> and after that you can be as creative as you like yeah, you, you could get a, a stronger machine and do more. Hey, Chris, tell you what, I know you got to go in, in four to five minutes. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to hear from uh, about something we haven't heard from in a long time. Uh, I, I've been getting a lot of buzz uh, in, at my employer at the Telos Alliance about AM processing. It's been a hot topic for some reason for the last few days. So I thought we'd address the most amazing AM processor that I know of. Uh, and that is what it's, well, the Omnia 9 is there. But the Omnia 7 is too, and it's it's at a heck of a value. We're going to uh, watch a really quick uh, minute and a half video about the Omnia 7 AM and, uh, and watch for a cameo appearance from me at the WSM transmitter site. And then um, we're going to come right back. And Chris, I want you to finish up by telling us about encoding for the different platforms like YouTube Live and and and, and uh, Facebook Live. Just give us a, an idea, a little look at how you make that happen, okay? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, Suncast, let's roll that Omnia 7 AM video, and we'll be right back in a minute and a half. Advances in audio cleanup are making FM sound cleaner than ever. Now, AM stations can enjoy the same clean, clear, and powerful audio processing. Meet the Omnia 7 AM, a feature-rich AM audio processor engineered to clean up source material and the first new processor in years dedicated to AM broadcasting. While others are using old and outdated technology in their processors, the Omnia 7 AM delivers the powerful, clear, and precise Omnia signature sound that's the first choice for top stations worldwide. Undo audio technology and the amazing declipper from the Omnia 9 and Omnia 7 FM are proven to bring over-processed audio back to life. These exclusive technologies are perfect for AM broadcasting too. Omnia 7 AM's dry voice detector detects speech and applies appropriate processing for clearest possible voice quality. Next, it's a three-stage wideband AGC with adjustable sidechain equalization and program-dependent two- to five-band AGCs and limiters. But the big deal for AM is the final clipper. It's an exclusive psychoacoustic-controlled distortion masking clipper. It analyzes and masks distortion perceptible to the human ear, leaving only clean, clear audio. It offers the same distortion masking performance as the FM version, but redesigned for AM. Plus, the Omnia 7 AM output delivers up to 150% maximum positive peaks. Omnia 7 AM includes the full Omnia toolbox, including real-time audio analyzer, oscilloscope, and FFT displays. And every aspect of Omnia 7 AM processing is remote controllable in real time with remote audio monitoring. Omnia 7 AM, the new premium AM audio processor that's surprisingly affordable. F affordable is right. I've, I own the FM version of that. And uh, I've got I've got another Omni on our AM station, but amazing stuff. Check it out at uh, telosalliance.com and then click on Omnia. And thanks so much to the Telos Alliance. Uh, also, Leif Clayson, Cornelius Gould, Frank Foti, the whole team there, the whole Omnia team for making such awesome products that I get to talk about and use. All right, Chris Tobin, uh, in the remaining few minutes we have left, why don't you show us what you have to do to take this video signal and audio and make it appear for the masses? All right, let's do it this way. Let's have some fun with this. Here we go. We'll go back to our screen. 
I'll be the Vanna White holding the camera, showing you everything. <laughs> so uh, what we do is we go down to the stream uh, icon, and there's a little, uh, uh, what do you call it, sprocket. Click on the sprocket for configuration. And as you can see, it brings up destination for your profile for streaming. And then you click on the destination pull-down menu, and all of mm -hmm. a sudden you have all these various methods you can stream out to. Ustream, oh, YouTube, Livestream, okay. Wowza Cloud, Stream Shark, uh, Periscope, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, Cloud Media Group. There's a whole slew of them. Or you have a, a custom RTMP server, and Facebook does RTMP, so you may do decide to do that choice rather than logging into your particular account. As you can see on the mm -hmm. right-hand side is the login. And then down below mm -hmm. is the quality that you choose. So um, since we have lots of bandwidth here, we usually go with the... Uh, Two and a half, the five meg setting. I forget where it is. It's in here somewhere. So you can do H.264, 720p, two and a half meg. You do MP3 audio. You can do Twitch uh, service uh, for their connections. Periscope has their standards. Uh, there's a few things. So you can pick and choose however you'd like to go. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. And then the application, you could do the FFmpeg or the uh, Flash Media Live uh, encoder. You have those mm. choices of application. Mm -hmm. and, and that will dictate sometimes, is dictated by the service you're going to. Some mm. places only only allow that. Others do not. And uh, that's pretty much it. And you can view the status of your connection once you're up and running. You have log files you can check. There's a few things. And that's as easy. It's as simple as that. And I believe you can do up to two or three streams simultaneously. Now, word of caution, and I do this because I have worked with some folks who do this every weekend. Try not to stream and produce your video product on the same machine. Okay? We're, oh. we're going back to that resource issue. Mm -hmm. You're streaming. Mm -hmm. Your streaming needs a lot of resources to make sure it's steady, error mm -hmm. checking. And then you have your video work and you're doing production overlays and everything else. That machine best be a very, very powerful. Your best bet would be use a separate machine just to stream out. Make it think of it like a network operation. Mm -hmm. You have a production distribution point, a production ingest, and then you have the production you know, outgoing, and that's that's the way to look at it. How would you um, connect two machines together? Let's say you had a, a one PC running vMix to do your your production, another you, PC running yeah. perhaps vMix, just the encoding part there. How would you connect? You them? could use you could do NDI. You can do oh. the uh, you could do the old fashioned way, which is a hardware solution. Have mm -hmm. a hardware card, video card out to a video card in on your other machine. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. Yeah. Okay. And again, okay. the goal is you know, the goal is here is not to be do it on the cheap. The goal is to produce something that is professional, reliable. People want it, and they come back for it more. So you can you make money at it. If you're going yeah. to cheap out and say, "Well, I should be able," you, you know, I've met many folks. I've gone through this issue. I should be able to do it all on one machine. Why not? I was like, that's not the the, the question. That's not the, the the workflow. The idea is you're producing a show. You want a flexibility producing it. You know, in television, there was a reason why you had every control room had a certain layout. If everyone remembers, you know, there's the front row for the, the, the technical director. And then there's the switcher in front. On the right-hand side was the audio guy. Then behind mm -hmm. that was one set of the directors. Then there was another guy. Oh, the digital effects. Can I have the Chiron? Can I have slides? Can I have who's in, and everybody had a layer. Now you can do all of that in one machine. The one part you shouldn't give up on or, or compromise on is how you get it out to everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the transmitter was typically not in the same room that the... Producers were exactly. technical director. <laughs> the exactly. Well, I, 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 know, I know his reasons for that, but yeah. yeah. It's yeah. true. And but, I only say this because I, I, two years ago, I was working on a project in Philadelphia. We were doing live streaming uh, and all kinds of crazy stuff. And the production folks we worked with insisted that everything should be able to be done on one machine. This is ridiculous. It, I don't want to do it the old-fashioned way. And I said to him, I said, look, what you call old-fashioned was state-of-the-art, Okay. Today, the state of the art is now doing all the production in one machine, but distribution or streaming, we'll call it, should mm -hmm. still be offloaded to something else that's dedicated. Because remember, when you have dedicated devices doing dedicated operations, are those the ones that have the nine, nine, five, five nines of reliability? <sighs> yes, that's correct. They do. But if you take the device that doesn't have that capability and decide to make it five nines like a desktop computer, what happens? Blue screen, me freezing up in video like we did before, you know, things like that. And if you're offered a software update, don't do it before yes. the show. <laughs> don't do any software updates. Turn off all those auto features. I, it's just annoying. Chris, thank you so much for taking us on a tour with that. I feel like I understand this much, much better now. And maybe I even better understand what's going on at our network, the GFQ network, where I believe vMix is the software that's being used to produce this very show. Am, am yes, I right? And 
you're you're right. And and the GFQ network is doing it exactly the way it makes sense. And I've worked with those guys for, for five years now, if not more. And mm -hmm. we are what you're watching right now. You're seeing us on the VMix system, the uh, the production machine it's known as, and all mm -hmm. the elements of the show happen are on the production machine. But then, this output of this machine is handed off to two other machines. Uh, what are they doing? That's right. They're streaming out to CDNs, both audio, video, and other stuff. Every where this this network is appearing, there is a machine dedicated to getting that video and audio to that destination. Oh, that's why okay. Okay. that's why the GFQ network is reliable, up and running, and always there. Otherwise, if the production machine and streaming was being done, and the production machine needed to be rebooted because we decided to change something, that means you lose everything else. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have the streaming machine set up properly, you can go to a slide or a predetermined video and just throw that into the stream, you know, while while you're fixing something. Oh yeah, you forgot about that part. Good advice. Good advice, <laughs> Chris. I, I know you got to run. It's five after, man. You got a broadcast coming up, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, and you got to eat at some point. You got to eat. Uh, yeah, I'll be doing that shortly. That's that's first. Okay. okay, good deal. Good deal. Hey, we got to run. Thank you for for all that help, and uh, and and we'll uh, we'll you can bet that we'll look at this again when there's new technology. The technology changes. We're probably going to take a good look at the HDV mixer package uh on a future episode too we're going to get one of the developers of that uh so that uh you know we radio folks we radio engineers can become very familiar with how this stuff works so that when we're asked to do it or maybe if we go suggest that the station does this oh, yeah. uh could be could be new new revenue streams hey you know what i talk to so many station owners and managers where they tell me that half or almost half of their revenue is now non-traditional revenue that means not spots so yeah if you want to you want to feed the mouths and pay the employees and keep the lights on you got to be looking at non-traditional revenue that is for sure all right chris thanks a lot man have a great weekend and merry christmas to you ah, merry christmas to you too have a great weekend and we'll catch up with, with everybody next week yeah we'll see you next week and uh, chris tar may may be on the show next week with some nice. uh yeah, with, with some ideas. If <laughs> here's what they are, it, engineer friends. If you didn't get what you want for Christmas, Chris Tar will tell you where to get the cool stuff. <laughs> what what you wanted to have. <laughs> that's what. That's what. That's the idea of the show. All right. Hey, uh, thanks uh, very much to Suncast for switching and producing today's show. Thanks very much, Suncast, and also Andrew Zarian, the founder of the GFQ Network, where you'll find lots of other fine podcasts, including What the Tech and Matt Men. We got to go. Thanks to our sponsors. Please patronize them and uh, watch for the show notes. We'll have some things in there. I'm Kirk Harnack. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.